Good afternoon, legacy viewers from Bloemfontein this afternoon, uh, where I'm in conversation with uh, two of the Pathfinders, uh, Leon Ackerman uh, up from Durban and Tuni Nuga from Boerteville. From Boerteville, free from, state. Uh, welcome, guys. Nice to have you on board. Um, perhaps you can just start, um, I don't know, if, uh, maybe just... Uh, give us a bit of background, how you got to be Pathfinders. Um, if you want to, English Afrikaans is not uh, serious. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity, Andrew. Um, I was um, brought, brought up in Pretoria. I schooled in Littleton. Um, and then I was called up to the Defence Force in 1978. Um, called up to one um, signals regiment in, in Heidelberg. And that's where the first officers from uh, one parachute battalion came around and they did a selection for parachute training. So it was a volunteer um, operation and we ended up in the one parachute battalion under Major Krundlin and Saki Murray was our, our um, non-commissioned officer. And then from there we did our basic training for three months and after that we did our PT course, three week PT course, uh, we did, underwent string, stringent um, uh, physical training and then passing that we then started with, a, with our parachute course, static line parachute course. That's where I started with the battalion and maybe Tuni can give us a background on where he came from and how he ended up in the battalion. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, for yeah. this opportunity. I think it's great. Um, more or less the same story. I'm just from the Free State, Wittabo. I grew up there, went there to school, and then I was called up to um, 11th Commando in Kimberley. And uh, after four days, the uh, uh, parachute battalion major Yules and Corporal Clausens, and there was a loot, I can't remember his name, came to select. And you had to do some physical training, run a 2,4 and do some sit-ups and stuff uh, that you had to uh, endure. And uh, we were about 40 guys from there selected and we went to Bloemfontein by train. And uh, yes, uh, did the same. We were in De Delta Company all together. There were about 120, 130 guys in, in Delta Company. And after PT course, a couple of guys were RTU, returned to the units and we did the uh, we, 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 we started met, to meet, meet each other there and then we uh, were selected after some other training for Pathfinders. This is more or less the background. Okay. Just as a matter of interest, Pathfinders, was that a relatively new concept at that stage? I mean, I know there were Pathfinders in the war, World Wars and things like that, but from a South African perspective, had we had Pathfinders before or was it a fairly new there were there were pathfinders um there were a few uh, pathfinders uh, i can maybe just name a couple of them lieutenant uh, boone uh, sergeant major uh, liebenberg and that uh, there was a corporal von sale corporal grobler and a lieutenant van Wijk. but they were under captain rabi selected as pathfinders or named pathfinders but they didn't physically complete or comprehend finishing a, a proper yeah. Pathfinder training course. Okay. But that's where the, the Pathfinder name established in the One Parachute Battalion. But the, the, the Pathfinder platoon and the establishment and the need for the Pathfinder platoon actually started after Operation Reindeer, where um, we all know what happened at, at, uh, at the Battle of Kasinga and the paratroopers and the, uh, the, the assault force was dropped incorrectly and it took Colonel Breitenbach with all these officers on the ground about two and a half hours to get everyone regrouped and to then launch the attack. By that time they lost all the initiative as a late attack and luckily for the South African Defence Force there weren't many casualties. Although the, the battle became, you know, turned out very successful afterwards but um, this is where, where we actually started the need or the need profound for, uh, for the Pathfinder uh, company and the need for Pathfinders as a 
ground force to be uh, um, to be put on the ground before the main force actually arrives. Although the, the aircraft all flew directly onto target with the, with the Battle of Kasinga, the parachutists were dropped incorrectly because there was no ground force on the ground to direct the, the jump, get the correct timing on the, on the green light for the forces to jump. So that ended up with the guys actually being dropped off kilometers of far away. So that's where the establishment of the pathfinders come in. There was a need for an established, well-trained and specialized force to be on the ground when, when the first parachutes actually uh, are deployed. Yeah, uh, can I just uh, fill in here? It was uh, also uh, the, the Redis. That's not their job to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, pathfinder specifically is to get the dropping zone or a landing zone yeah. and then bring in the either fighter planes or bring in paratroopers and this is what we were specifically trained for yeah. so we did a lot of courses and yeah. stuff in the, I, in the, in the and, and, I, and I think it was a relatively small unit the pathfinders yeah we, if we could just go back to the selection process um, the, a D company when the need arised for um, Kuma Breitenbach to identify the, 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 the training and the establishment of the pathfinder company um, there were 83 volunteers from D Company that volunteered for the selection for Pathfinders. Only 19 of the 83 were finally selected to do a, 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 a medical and, and psychological tests at uh, MMI in, in, in Littleton, Pretoria. And those 19 guys then ended up doing the first free fall course where the first national service servicemen were actually trained as you know to to uh, to do uh, free fall only nine of the 19 eventually made that um we uh, lieutenant wooden at that time uh, sorry not lieutenant Wooden, lieutenant uh, Lindbergh. Lindbergh. he was our leader uh, uh, uh you know leader uh, part of the of, of the of the of this uh, the pathfinders yeah he was he was a permanent force okay was, yeah, yeah. He was unfortunately injured at the during the, the jump course and he couldn't complete the, the, the free fall course. But then after finishing the free fall course, the that, that was actually the establishment of the first nine national service pathfinders that then started with all the different training courses. Okay. Yeah, I mean I was also just national service and um, did my first year at one side and then six one. And um, you know, we from time to time would bump into reckies and from time to time would interact with say three two. But Pathfinders was sort of a name that that we didn't have we, we'd heard about them but we didn't sort of never so that's why I assumed it was a relatively small uh, yeah. operation or a small um, unit and such yeah. Okay, then um Did, did you guys have a, a base somewhere, or were you just based at Parabats in Bloemfontein, or, or was yeah, that... Maybe I should answer that. Uh, no, okay. We were based in Bloemfontein at the One Parachute Battalion, but uh, when that yeah. started, because yeah. we were issued with R4 rifles, that's the first people that got R4 rifles, for instance, you know, nobody, nobody knew about the R4 rifles, and we started now with a, with a uh, advanced uh, medical course and advanced... Uh, uh, Signal is course, you know, Morse code and and, 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 and and like that, and the DZ course and the LZ courses that that we all did in the section leading leaders course in in in, uh, in that. But uh, then the uh, and we were then uh, under Colonel uh, Breitenbach, you know, so he was in charge of us specifically. But uh, we were uh, uh, really sent around in the battalion. Then we are staying in this. Um, uh, a bungalow and then a week later they tell us now you're staying there in that bungalow and then a week later in that bungalow and then we ended up with the with the with the chefs you're staying with the chefs you know you get the, the manasi yeah. the, the, the mess. and uh, but we all took it you know with a smile and mm -hmm. we just just did our training and uh, and so on but uh, but uh, uh, it was, uh, it was, we could feel it that, yeah, uh, that you weren't really uh, wanted <laughs> yeah. you know, towards yeah. us. Because uh, I think uh, why also previously, like uh, Leon said, is uh, 
uh, uh, the previous pathfinders before us, they only did the, like a free fall course, yeah. you know, and then it stopped there. Yeah. But now this thing was now really going into far more specialized, specialized, specialized yeah. unit yeah. as such. Okay. And then uh, sort of deployed into to Southwest Africa, would you have had a base there or would you have no. just sort of fitted in wherever there was a... We, um, the, the first, uh, um, it's called an exercise, airborne exercise that, uh, that we executed was a, a training exercise that we flew up with the Dakota from Bloemfontein to Uppington. The first stick was dropped at Uppington, second stick in Kietmansworth. And the third stick was it uh, jumped at Winterk. That was our first, we call it Pathfinder deployment. And the reason for that was to, to uh, firstly establish comms with, with headquarters, with uh, VH uh, radios. And we also had VHF radios to communicate with the, with, with the aircraft as we, uh, you know, after we, we landed off the exit. And that was also to test our medical equipment. Our specialized backpack equipment, the, we, we then jumped with the, with the R4s for the first time we ever jumped with R4s. And also, you know, a, a basic equipment, what equipment would be needed in a, in a bush deployment like that. From then on, we, we came back to base and then we, 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 we had to do um, different courses, which we started off with, uh, with minor tactics. Minor tactics was presented by one recce at four doppies. And that's where we got the first introduction to these real bush warriors um, that uh, chased the hell out of, out of all of us. But that, yeah. that was a, a real experience yeah. under Captain Meralts. Uh, he was a, the, the team leader with uh, some other rookies like Maddies and Queros. And uh, uh, it's Staff Sergeant Wiverosa. Yeah, and Jimmy Wiverosa. Jimmy Wiverosa. <laughs> and that's when we started Minor Tactics. That was a 28 day course where we did all kind of bushcraft, specialized bush, bushcraft uh, uh, training. And uh, yeah, Tony, maybe you can tell us about a few stories of doppies, what you can remember about doppies. Yeah, um, you, you, uh, what happened is we, when we finished our uh, jumping course, the free fall course, the, that evening we had obviously a couple of drinks because we got our silver wings. And uh, Staff Sergeant Tippett, Dave Tippett, he was uh, one of the instructors. And he told us there that we, we're going to do now a minor tactics course. And that's, this is going to be much worse than the PT course that we did. And we all thought, but he doesn't know. What does he know about PT course? But he also did PT course. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a, a recce. And then we, when we landed in, um, in uh, uh, Fort Dorpies and we started with that course, then we realized... What, what physical training was because it's no water, it's yeah. warm. You walk, you walk with a kit, and uh, they give you training during the day. And uh, at night, they just give you a new RV, and you must walk there, and you must do, do it very clandestine. And they actually follow you and they watch you. And at some stage, it started shooting at us, and you had to, uh, I don't know what the English is, eight by Kruta. And uh, they start running away, they shoot in between us, yeah. you know, so you, they do the real thing with you. And um, yeah, uh, uh, this, was, this was a real, real uh, uh, eye-opener for us. And they also said, and I just want to correct uh, Leon here, is that uh, they said that the, the, the course takes between 23 days and 30 days. This is how long it takes. They don't tell you when it's finished. So you can't look forward to listening. Uh, this is now a, the 19th We've got a weekend pass coming yeah. up in four weeks' time. Nothing <laughs> like that. So they, uh, they just tell you now it's finished. You know, at that stage, then you are also finished. Yeah. <laughs> you know, physically. But, uh, yeah, there was some very interesting stories uh, that, 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 uh, that happened there. From Mellonel, I remember we had to do a, 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 a skin operation uh, uh, skin whipper RC and uh, but you only walk at night so you start actually walking 10 11 o'clock at night in the very plainest time two three kilometers two kilometers uh, an hour and uh, you must wreck you had to go and put out the DZ and from Mala I will never forget uh, we we decided illegally but we're not gonna make it in time we'll have to walk during the daytime but know that somebody might see us, but yeah. we did it very clandestine. And so one suddenly he's just sat down, he started packing, unpacking all his kit. You know, your kids, 60, 70 kgs that you carry with you, oh. he packed everything out. So everybody was now just actually 
went down and just checking what's going on with him and he got everything out and then he got the chappy out of his kit. And he stopped eating his chappy and he put everything back and we started walking with him. <laughs> it was, yeah. yeah. And uh, we had some experiences with uh, with, with uh, Buffalo. Buffalo chased us, you know. This is where we, we were taught that uh, you walk behind Buffalo and two times they will run away and then they stand, they will, they will uh, turn around and then they stampede their own tracks. And we had to just scatter, get into trees for the Buffalo to get past. So all sorts of things, are, you know, I can yeah. go on for long. I don't know if there's something specific that AC now uh, remembers, then I can uh, yeah, elaborate right. on that. Talking about wild animals, um, there was one specific um, exercise that we had to do. It was a night route operation where we were dropped off um, somewhere and we had to get back to base. But it all started at Freedom Square. We got our... our um, instructions and, uh, and and we were briefed on an individual route march which we were going to do a full kit but it was going to be at night and they gave us a compass bearing and said this is your this is your bearing to get you back to base and they took us off in, in the unimogs and we traveled north towards the, the the golden highway and along the golden highway and then we veered off and they hit directly west in a westerly direction at last light and every two kilometers, they dropped every, every one of us individually. And that's when you, for the first time, you're in the middle of Africa, you get uh, dropped off by yourself and you just got this compass bearing, you know, you, get a, you need to get back to base. And realizing this compass bearing is like a, just around about a 300 um, degree bearing that they gave us, but 300 degrees is more north than south. And we knew, knew we were traveling south out of base and we had to get back to Badopis, which was south. Um, obviously, every person had his own, you know, um, expectation and his own evaluation of what he had to do. Either head south and walk south on a compass, or walk south on, on, on the Southern Cross. Or some of us realised you actually had to take a back bearing. They gave us the bearing from Dorpies to the point that we were going to be dropped off at, and then from that, that drop off point, you had to take a back bearing. Not all of us realised that, so we had to walk back to Dorpies. Dark moon, just uh, luckily it, was, it wasn't clouded up so we could follow the stars. And that's where you end up, well I end up personally ended up amongst a, a whole herd of elephant <laughs> in pitch darkness and you just hear these rumbling tummies, you hear the, all the branches break and you realize you're amongst <laughs> real elephants now. And then you had to get out of there. By starting to start running in the pitch dark, you run into Arkansteak bush. You know what Arkansteak is? That bush just grabs you and tears you apart. But in any case, we, we got back to base. And not all of us got back to base that night. So um, after midnight, we all got to bed. The guys that arrived went to bed. And there were three guys that didn't arrive back. So we woke up for breakfast, had breakfast, and... Um, Corey Merrill said to us, listen, we're having a briefing at, uh, at uh, Freedom Square. Get all your kit, everything ready. We're going on the next route march. And then when we went back to, 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 to our bungalows, you know, the bungalows were all thatched roofs, open sides, just reeds, uh, like a real lodge. The Fort Dorpies was developed and built in a, like a real lodge style, not like an army base. Yeah. So we got to, to the bungalow and here this gentleman was lying flat on, on his face on bed with his heavy pack on his head, hardly breathing. He was out, out for a count. So we got him up and we got him to, to, to square and then from there back onto the unibox and to the next week, but the guy, was, he was asleep and dead on his, on his feet. And then uh, um, Jimmy Wilbur also came and told us, listen, Paul, oh, just wait. We sent a Patel star to go and look for the guys. We got one guy, the other two are still missing. So they sent up a Telstar, which is a Bosbok aircraft that they sent up from Apache into Angola to try and find and locate the other two guys, which they eventually found by VHF radio because they, they managed to, to get contact with the guys. But that's how we, we did our first route march individually in the bush all of ourselves. Okay. Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, Colonel Breitenbach, he, he seemed to be wherever there was a sort of special forces matter because I mean you guys he was involved with the three two recce wing I think he was a founder of that and he was also involved with the recce eh? 
I think it's one of his... As well as Kampus. C1 battalion, yeah. And C1, C1. so, so he, he, yeah. certainly, he certainly got the special forces yeah, he side was a, of things. He was a trailblazer yeah. in establishing special yeah. forces. And, and, and the other thing, the fact that you went for psychological evaluation, that must have been quite, I mean, nearly, what, 45 years, 46 years ago, oh, it, it must have been quite an advanced way of thinking. That you know, we must check that these guys can handle it before they even stop. Yeah, maybe maybe we must just um, uh, see how we'll evaluate how the first nine guys were were, were qualified as you know in, in uh, as, as, as the first three four parachuters. Mm -hmm. Nineteen of us went to um, to MMI for yep. the psychological and medical tests, and only nine guys were then selected to proceed with the Pathfinder course. We were then later told that the other 10 guys that didn't pass the free fall course were actually not suitably qualified to become a small teams operator um, because of their psychological tests that okay. weren't 100%. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, they didn't qualify yeah. 100%. But, you know, I'm just saying that's quite advanced thinking, really. You know, um, I think I was just a troopie, and, and I think there's a lot that we didn't understand. I had um, Jan Milan at the War Museum in Joburg, my first interview, in fact, for Legacy, where he went through the rattle from the front to the back. Now, I mean, I used to, a long time ago, sit in the back of the rattle. But, you know, when he started explaining why this was there and you just realize how much thought, other than the fact that you had a, a quite a mean machine, but internally there was so much thought given to to everything. And I, and I suppose it's the same, you know, they've thought this out. We, we can't just take anyone. The fact that he can do a million push-ups doesn't necessarily mean he can yeah. operate as a small team. Um, another interesting thing, um, I interviewed a, a Russian interpreter that was in Angola two, two days ago. And uh, the only Afrikaans he knew was Hark and Stirk. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's quite, it's quite strange two days later. Yeah. Okay, then, then in terms of small teams, okay, so there were nine of you. Would that then be divided into three teams of three? Or, I mean, what was a small team? How big was a small team? Yeah, maybe Tuni was just was, maybe more explain the, yeah, the, was, the leadership. Yeah, we yeah. didn't have any leaders at that yeah. stage. It was only us. Von Mellenell, he was in the, he, he, when he started uh, his basic training in, in, in the army, he uh, already had a degree. You know, he, was, mm -hmm. he went to university, then he came to the army. The other, the, all of us uh, came straight out of the street. Yeah. So he was quite fast. He was uh, um, before the, to Camp Corporal. And uh, then uh, it was split into two, two groups, five and four. All right, so we were the four group from Melle, uh, uh, Leon, he's AC actually, uh, myself and, uh, uh, I can't remember, was it Monel? Monel. Yeah, Monel. I mean, the four and the, the rest of them was, was uh, and there was another corporal, Corporal Pretorius. He only did bits and pieces with us and he was then their leader for some time and uh, uh, when we actually went to, to Fort Dopis for the uh, minor, tactics. minor tactics yeah. then uh, there were two uh, thieves going with uh, S -S Sergeant Lynch and uh, Corporal Morkel and uh, but they did not complete it. Uh, Askutter I mean uh, they uh, yeah Dan Skutter he's also passed away unfortunately but uh, uh, they they also had to do the course with us, but then they, they didn't complete the course. Okay. So then we were leaderless, and then later Kubus Wynn joined us. I can't well, seem to remember. Uh, Lieutenant Wynn was, was jumped in uh, because we, we didn't have any leadership. Yeah. We were just yeah. national servicemen, and uh, the, the need then arose to, to get a, a proper leader, and, and that's where Lieutenant Wynn was then parachuted into Fort Dopies. He was so busy with his parachute training course, his free fall parachute training course. And they jumped him in and he wasn't fully qualified, but that is another experience that yeah. Lieutenant Wim can maybe explain. And then he joined on with us. And then from, from minor tactics, we went on to, uh, to uh, uh, survival. 
uh, bushcraft and, tra and, and, and trekking, which was another specialized course that was also presented by, by um, one reconnaissance commander. At four droppies. Yeah, at, mm -hmm. at four droppies with um, Sergeant Major Diabo de Beer. I think he's also a legend in his own mm -hmm. right. Um, so he was our, our leader, uh, course leader during, uh, um, during that, uh, you know, a bushcraft and, yeah. and, and a survival course. I think we must just tell all the courses that we did. Okay, you know, we, so we'll we just did, carry on. So I will yeah. just have to look okay. up here. Yeah, he can also yeah. help me, but uh, we, we did now the uh, section leaders course there. You got uh, it. Uh, yeah, I've got some of my. Uh, we yeah. did uh, uh, the. Uh, the, the, the air attack uh, um, officer's course. Yeah, at, in Pretoria. Air assault. And, uh, air assault. Air assault. And the yeah. uh, uh, photo lease. If if I do, um, yeah, if, if, um, yeah, because yeah. there were no maps, you know, uh, beyond interpretation, it. I suppose, it would yeah. be of a of yeah. a air photo, yeah, yeah, because we were sitting there at Leer School, it was very intensive yeah. because it, there were no maps on the Angola and Zambia, Angola. and yeah. so on. So the Canberras flew at 50,000 feet plus, and then they took these uh, photos, and then you just get these big photos back and it's black and then you must uh, you put them over each other and you sit with a stereoscope over it. It's, 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 it it takes a long time for you to realize how to look at it yeah. and then suddenly you see through the bushes three dimensions three yeah. dimension yeah. it comes out you know a little footpath yeah. here and there and whatever so and this was the maps that we used when we went operational was that from from those air photos that you had to work off uh, so this is what we did it. So uh, very interesting there at uh, Leer School in Pretoria, we did that. And uh, we, uh, this is also where we had to uh, do the, this Lach Contact Officer's cursus in Lach Fortulius cursus in Sam Ghanivet to bring in airstrikes, you know, we had to uh, do that uh, physically, bring in the aircraft, uh, talk them in. Uh, very interesting course. Uh, you uh, you had to talk very fast when they bring the faster aircraft in, you know, and then you get a bit rattled. But you had to uh, adapt to that. Um, then uh, from the uh, the LZ and DZ courses, DZ courses that we had, landing zone and dropping zone courses. This we did at uh, one parachute battalion. Uh, the minor tactics, the Bosch and Spursna, you were living that we talked about. Um, um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I did some other courses afterwards, Lichtstorm, Gefechtshantering, you know, captain's course that I did, uh, that was afterwards. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it all goes with, with, uh, with, we actually did, which sounds strange now, but most of the courses we did that, uh, the, the, the Rickies did. Yeah. Okay, we were just not permanent force, you know, they had to yeah. do all this in nine months because yeah. from there we went operational and we were almost the whole time we were across the border and yeah. the last three months of our national service we were in Rhodesia, you know, and now yeah. Zimbabwe, we, we did, and nobody knew at that stage that there was operations done by South African Defence Force in, in, in Rhodesia, we had to help Ian Smith. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is about... Uh, how far I can we take it. With. Yeah, we also worked with 3 1 Italian when we also didn't have leaders at that stage. Yeah. Yeah. We, we went to, to Omega, uh, the base camp, and uh, there was a, a, a Lieutenant Nell, and that's Maddie's. Maddie's and them were from 3 1. Mm -hmm. They were not the uh, reconnaissance commander. And uh, so we did, we did a couple of operations with, with, with them. them yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, then we, we ended up in, in Rhodesia doing mainly uh, OPs, you know, that's uh, you do opera yeah, operational yeah. Um, observation yeah. posts, yeah. and then talking in fire force operations, you know, bringing the fire force, uh, where that's, that's where our, our D company uh, were then also based in, in, in Rhodesia, and they, they did the fire force, we were now the, in the OPs talking yeah. the, the fire force in. That we did until we cleared out. What yeah, are some gruesome things that happened yeah. there? I don't know if you so, talk about that. You know what? If you if you want to talk about it, talk about it, and then if the powers that be want to cut it out, they can cut it out. Yeah, um, um, just more or less. Uh, we 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 were, we were dropped off. We didn't jump in with it. Only four of us. Uh, 
very near the, 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 the red hot zone of uh, the uh, zone of beef area and uh, we had the operation to do you know in a very hot area and uh, we had to, to walk very deep in but when the moment we were drop off we were we there was a person coming in that saw us and we had to get rid of him and i was the signaler and uh, to do, we, we chose amongst ourselves you know who was going to be the leader of that and it was martin stein he was the leader and he was talking to back to base and they said no get rid of this guy yeah okay. maybe um Maybe just uh, on, on, on Rhodesia, when, when we finished with Rhodesia, we still didn't have any, didn't have any rank. And uh, we found out that our juniors that came a year after us, that we were also assisted in, in training up at Doppies, because they also did the same courses as us, and also at, at uh, Fort Doppies. Um, we, we were about to clear out, and we knew that our D Company guys that we were called up for had already been in back to Bloemfontein, already passed all their, all their equipment back, and we were still in the bush. So um, we then hurried back to, to Bloom to clear out with these guys. And as we arrived there, we heard that... The juniors you know, got rank. <laughs> no, juniors got rank and you got to go back to, 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 to Rhodesia. You're not clearing out now. When we got back to, to, to Rhodesia, um, uh, we, we had a, a, a new leader. Um, Major Murphy. Major Murphy. He was from the SAS and he now joined the Pathfinders. And he said to us, guys, um, we'd like you to stay on for another year. We want you to sign on for another third year, but we'll give you, we'll give you one strike. We'll make you lance corporals, and then you can join for another year. And we said, no ways. We're not going to join. But yeah. this stage, just becoming lance corporals and then stay on for another yeah. year, we want to clear out now. So um, we were then officially lance corporals, and the day we had to leave R Rhodesia, we... Um, we met up with, uh, with uh, other leadership groups, with the Air Force, there were Air Force officers and non-commissioned officers, and we wanted to go and have lunch just before we left, but we just came out of the bush. We were dirty, we weren't showered, we had long hair, beards, everything, and they didn't allow us into the, into the non-commissioned officers' mess, because we weren't troops anymore, we weren't eating with the troops, we were now non-commissioned officers. So they wouldn't allow us in. Because we didn't have stripes, because we were in the bush, there was no stormman to issue us with stripes and all that. So this one particular staff sergeant, he was an Air Force staff sergeant, he refused us entry. So we said, okay, well, we'll go to the, to the canteen, we'll buy ourselves some chips and peanuts and all that. And we got into the aircraft, coming back to South Africa, into the Dakota. And flying operational, you always fly treetop height. And the Dakota is not one of the most stable aeroplanes that you can get. And this thing started catching air pockets and we we're going up and down and we saw this star, this star sergeant getting yellow and he started turning pink and he turned all kinds of colors and the more we saw him getting sick we were used to flying we fly flew yeah. an avi aircraft that the, that the air force had at that time so we started eating more peanuts and chips and drinking and the more we started eating with him and offering <laughs> some peanuts this like started getting sick and there were no air, air bags, sick, you know, yeah. bed, uh, sick bags. So this oak had to use his, his head beret <laughs> for, for, his, uh, for his business. And that we sat with and the rest of the flight back to South Africa. Um, and we were laughing and talking, but this guy was really sick. He was turning all kinds of colors. We got off from the aircraft. He went and dumped his, his uh, stuff that he had in his, in his helmet. And in his head, uh, head gear. His beret. And his beret. It's not actually a beret, you know, it's one of those. Uh, those yeah. yeah. And uh, we had to go through the gates. But now we all put our bush hats on. We didn't have any berets because no one knew from which unit we were. So we put our, our head gear on. We told the, the star shots, you, you need to put your head gear back on. <laughs> you know, you, it's now official. We're going to do the airport terminal. Yeah, you need to put your head gear back on. Very reluctant, he put his, his head gear back on. <laughs> <laughs> now you can imagine after a few, <coughs> few minutes all the things were just running down, down his, his face. face. <laughs> yeah, I suppose there's a bit of humor in everything. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, operationally, were you guys always dropped in? Um, yeah, most of our operations, uh, I can't recall that we drove into any operations. We jumped into every jumped operation into that we did. Uh, all our uh, um, operations were, were jumped in either static line or free fall, but um, mostly clandestine. Yeah, the one time we were we were taken in by, by
by, um, Chopper. by, by Chopper, free, uh, free yes. loan and also um, Puma. Puma. Yeah, so um, okay. most of them were jumping. And, and, and as a matter of interest, have you guys continued jumping? Did you jump afterwards, uh, civilian jumping? Or? I, I did after after my national service. I continued jumping. I bought a private parachute and I joined the water. Uh, um, uh, the, not the water, uh, water cliff. Um, North of Pretoria, what is it? Airport called? Um, Vonnebaum. Vonnebaum. Yeah, yeah we, I joined Vonnebaum and started jumping. So then, but just going back, the, the other course which you didn't mention was, was Halo. We did Halo Ohio. Um, uh, a lot of our junior groups that followed after us also did AO and, and Halo. I particularly did my, my course in, in uh, Nimkuzi in Northern Zululand. Um, Tuni, where did you do your yeah. emblem? You did it in Bloemfontein. Yeah. That was, uh, that was quite uh, an exciting course. We also we were um, taught to, to pack our own parachutes, pack and fold our own parachutes. Uh, that we also did with one reconnaissance commander. They, they presented the course in, in uh, all the, the practical training. We did it uh, at one Ricky's base in, in the bluff. And then the, the jumping, we all did it uh, at Mkuzi in northern Zululand. That was jumping between 20 and 28,000 foot. That's, that's the highest that we jumped was 28,000 foot. That's, that's a long way up. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> and, and in a jump like that, it's, it's obviously, obviously free fall to a certain point. Yeah, what, what happens is you, you, before, you, before you prepare for the jump, you need to do pre-breathing. So you sit on the ground, um, where you've got oxygen, and you pre-breathe oxygen to get more oxygen into your bloodstream uh, before you, you actually go up. And then once you in the aeroplane, you switch onto another breathing apparatus, uh, uh, um, oxygen breathing apparatus in the aeroplane, that while you fly up to get to your height of jumping, you still pre-breathe out of the, the containers. And then before you jump out, you switch over to a, 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 bailout, bottle. a bailout bottle, which would normally last you about three minutes. Okay. And whilst you jump, then you pre-breathe, you breathe that oxygen out of your, your bailout bottle. Um, a jump from 25,000 foot will probably take you about two and a half minutes uh, of free fall. And then you obviously you've got an a, a altimeter, which you will check your, and, and judge your, just your, your height for, for opening. That's normally about two and a half thousand foot. Okay, so that's, that's the height that you open. Yeah, so you do 90% free fall in the yeah. last 10%. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, but you can just uh, explain it. Uh, hey ho, it's high altitude, high opening. You also yeah. just jump out and you open your parachute and you make a, a formation. And then you, this is very clandestine, and then you fly in for every thousand foot that you fall under your parachute, you go one kilometer forward, depending on the wind. Uh, okay. All right, so if you uh, are 20,000 feet in the air, then you're going to travel 20 kilometers. Okay, that's interesting. Horizontally, yeah. 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 That's yeah. quite, so, you know, everything's got to be pretty well planned. Planned, yeah. yeah. If you want to be there, you've yeah. got to jump at that Only point yeah. To, yeah. to allow for the... But also taking into consideration, you're jumping with full kit, you've got yeah. a rifle, Full kit, you're fully operational. You've got plane wall mines, you've got mortar bombs, you've got um, every person's got his specialized weapons and, and uh, medical equipment, radios, everything that you carry with you. So if you jump out and you start falling um, unevenly, or you're going to a spin, or you can glide away from your, your other buddies that are in the air with you, you could land very far apart yeah, by the time sure. you start, you, yeah. you, you open your parachute. So that's where, you know. Proper training comes in. You, no, need, to, you need to know yeah. how, to, how to fall yeah. with, you know, how to free fall with all that heavy yeah. kit. And, and tell me the, the so the free fall part, two and a half minutes. The last two 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 and a half thousand feet. How long would that would that take? Also and, depending on the wind conditions, whether you're going, uh, you know, what yeah, what the sure. wind uh, uh, gusts are like. But that will take you probably about another. 35, 45 uh, sec seconds. Okay, yeah. so it's, so it's it will take a bit longer. Yeah. It will take a bit longer than that. Uh, because you open it when you do yeah, a halo, yeah, you open it three, three and a half thousand. Static line is about 30 yeah. seconds to 35, yeah. 30, okay. 40 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Then you jump from a thousand feet, you know. But, yeah. uh, okay, so, so all in all, sort of from 25,000 feet, less than five minutes, you, you're yeah, on the ground, the ground yeah. and you potentially 25 kilos down yeah. the road in, yeah. in terms yeah. of horizontally. 
Yeah, you know, obviously yeah. when you when you jump AO and you go horizontally, you can fly much longer. You yeah. stay much longer in the air yeah. until you start getting to your to your height of or yeah. turning into the wind and then landing into the wind. Okay, so that sort of covered the the various courses and the training and things yeah. like that. And how the Pathfinder started. Yeah. Started as national serviceman. Um, and then after that, more permanent force leadership joined okay. and they started um, processing more courses. Mm -hmm. And the Pathfinder, I think the last Pathfinder course that was presented was in 1988. So it's about 10 years. Yes, roughly speaking, of every yeah. year there was an intake of, of Pathfinder. And, and would the intake have normally been sort of Nine, ten, or did they get bigger along? As every, they... every year thereafter, the, the, the courses and, and, and the guys that actually passed the courses became more and more and more. more, and more. Okay. I think the biggest course was around about 30 people. Okay. 30, 30 I think people. if I remember correctly, I think all in all, there was only about 280 pathfinders. In total, over the 10 years, yeah, roughly. Yeah, so years, average of 25, 28 a year. Yeah. And, and in terms of camps, did you then go and do your camps back with pathfinders? Or... Um, yeah, we, we, we were never deployed conventionally, we were always deployed in, in, in tactical mm -hmm. format. Um, okay. So we always operated and moved in small groups. Um, one particular camp that I can maybe just uh, elaborate on, uh, we were called up to 44 Parachute Brigade just north of Pretoria. And um, we were all in telephone contact, there were no cell phones those times, we were in telephone contact with one another, so we knew who we were all more or less called up. But we didn't coordinate the dates. So Duncan, Elizabeth, and myself ended up at 44, uh, being called up, and Captain uh, von Oswegen said to us, but what are you guys doing here? He said, we were called up. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, we had to report. He said, you, you way too early, you're a week earlier than the main force. There's things happening, but um, you either stay here for another week and hang around the base doing nothing for a week, or you could go up and go and deploy operationally. At Ndongwa. So we said, no, we want to go up. So from entering the, the base at 44 at 8 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock, Waterkloof Air Force Base, we were on the free, uh, free line, uh, the, the, the C 130 Hercules. We flew into Ndongwa and we drew weapons. We filled up all our water, got kit, um, medical kit, food, and everything. We rationed up and we were told we're going in with a, with a rerun, ration rerun. There were pathfinders on the ground and we were going to join up with them. And that's where we met the Philistines. The Philistines was a, a group of pathfinders that were formed also by Colonel Breitenbach, who brought in SAS, RLI guys from, from Rhodesia. Okay, so, okay. so they were then called, they were also pathfinders, but they were operating in a, in a secluded you know, platoon on, them, on themselves. They didn't join the National Service guys, so they were permanent force. And... Um, we joined these guys on the ground. We flew in by, 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 uh, by Puma, uh, Duncan and I. We hadn't shot our rifles. We didn't know whether these things were shooting or operating or whatever. And uh, uh, we landed on the ground and the non-commissioned officer who was in charge, um, Sergeant Major Moorcroft, he said to us, guys, we've been in the felt here for over 10 days now. We've seen spur, but we haven't found any enemy, and it was a fighting force then. They would go out to do a reconnaissance, see if they could engage with Swapu. And um, you know, that's where he said to us, look, we've invited Swapu to attack us, because we can't find them. They're evading us. And we've sent a letter, you know, a handwritten letter with, with, a, with a Mapacha, a Majiba, sorry, Majiba, which is a young, young African boy, to come and attack us. And that's where the, the first up ceiling started as a pre-run for for uh, Protea um, and then Ops Protea followed also with Colonel Breitemach as the as the officer commanding of, of, of uh, Protea leading the the parachute and pathfinder contingent with sabers into Ops Protea. I can just for interest sake just uh, when you sit now they went up the uh, is uh, all our operations that we did we were issued with, with uh, AK-47s, we had nothing South African on us, you know, the, the kit, the, the weapons, weapon, everything was, was, uh, was uh, Russian orientated, you know, for each area they got this rice packs, you know, the clothing, so we had different uh, camo kits, so we uh, stayed at Mapacha, uh, uh, 
outside the base camp. We were on our own, so we didn't we were not allowed to mix with the rest of the people there. So we went in to get our food. So we made our, actually our own food uh, by the times that we were uh, in the base. And and just a, um, a hindsight qu hindsight question: Is there anything you felt? Could have been done better in terms of the training and the courses or do you feel that it sort of covered what you needed to be covered you know it's easy in hindsight to say oh, we should never have done that or we should have done that and it's just interesting to get your thoughts on that uh, uh, i don't think we, we can't speak for the guys that followed us but um you know most of the courses we did we we were presented by specialist um in regiments the, like yeah. reconnaissance regiment we went up to Pretoria to do the air attack officers course. It was a proper course sitting with majors and captains in the course. And we were yeah. only national servicemen. Yeah. Yeah, we, we were riflemen. We didn't have any rank. But the, yes, the, the courses we did were very specialized and uh, very well and professionally presented. Yes. Okay. I, I think this is just my thought. Maybe this should be an introduction to the Pathfinders. Okay. And then do a, a, a second follow up episode yeah. with leader, leadership and maybe groups that followed after us. Yeah. Because every, every year intake had its own experiences, um, yeah. own different courses that did, um, the venues and the, and the operations yeah. that they did were different to us. Mm. Um, yeah. as, as you said, we were national service, we did our two na national service in, and in camps Europe. after yeah. that. So we met up with other guys during camps yeah. and all that. But Every intake had its own totally, experiences, yeah, sure. its own leadership. And, and in terms of operations, obviously you were mainly Rhodesia. So we, we did six months of our of our deployment in, in Rhodesia. Yeah, six okay, months of so, about two years yeah. we spent in Rhodesia. Okay. Um, operations as campers? Yeah, well, we, we, we were part of Ops Protea, Protea. Um, and the pre-run for, for Ops Protea. We did other, other operations with the with 3-1 three, three Battalion, which is a, a extrusion uh, operation we did with 3-1. Yeah. Um, 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 yeah, I think that during next all, all, the, all the next phases of, of the episodes yeah. that you're going to be doing with the Pathfinders, I think it would yeah. be interesting looking at the training, the setup, how their whole formation was set up, and then the different operations that they, that they were actually yeah. conducting. It will be interesting, I think, to also for all of us to see what what different operations yeah. they were involved in. There were guys, I know after us, the, um, there, was a, there were Norris Crooks uh, yeah. awards for, for Pathfinders that took part in, uh, in, in, I think it was Modular, Operation Modular. Yeah. But yes, there were awards, yeah. uh, and there were quite a few brave bravery uh, um, yeah. uh, incidents that the Pathfinders were involved with. Yeah, because well, every, every operation uh, that, that uh, was conducted, you know, there, there are specific um, incidents and things that yeah. happened, which, and, and which you is know, good to tell. I, I, was, on, I was in uh, Operation Skeptic and Smoke Show where we, we lost 13 guys in the first 10 minutes or so. And I mean, it was, it, I think it was probably the biggest operation, certainly land-based operation, not mm. dropping parabats in at the time. And it was the biggest number that we've lost since the Second World War yeah. in a single day. Yeah. But, but recently, um, as part of this whole 3-2 thing, we were invited to the Reiki Wing uh, reunion in the Northern Cape last month, yeah, probably about a month ago. And um, the, I landed up doing an interview with two of the 3-2 Reiki guys who I had 40... Three years later, didn't realize that they were involved in smoke shop. Yeah. But they were there four or five days before us, clearing the, the route. And in fact, they lost three guys three days before we attacked uh, smoke shop. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's those things that, you know, we sit in the back of the rattle when we, when we get to the attack point, we jump out and we fight our way through. But, but there's all the, the behind the scenes stuff. Mm. And, and to me, in a way, it's, it's almost sad that we get recognition. Uh, a skeptic is seen as a 6-1 operation. Yeah, yeah. Yet 3-2 were involved as well. Yeah, there were, there were other units involved. And, and, and it was quite yeah. interesting sitting there with uh, uh, Peter, William, uh, Peter Williams and uh, Gavin Marburg, 
who were there with three two and discussing it and hearing this their, their side of the story because that's something that we I mean you can pick up a book on smoke shell and it doesn't mention yeah. it starts on the it might start at uh, Omatia when we left on the 8th of June and to Inanna on the 9th of June and yeah. the attack on the 10th of June. But but there's nothing saying on the 4th of June, three two guys went in and set up a, a base and cleared the roads and checked for landmines. And yeah. Well, n not even talking about the, the Ricky guys. The Ricky guys are obviously there weeks yes. before the time. Yes. R but, the, but we, but we I mean... Yeah. We knew there were wreckies because we, we bumped into them uh, in the three weeks around southern Angola of, of Skeptic. Because, I mean, we obviously hit smoke shell, but then we, yeah. we still spent three weeks there. And you'd bump into the odd recce. So, so we knew about wreckies. Yeah. Right? But, you know, in our minds, we lost 13 guys. But there were actually 16 casualties mm -hmm. because there were three, three two guys killed. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I think, you know, I just think the concept of, of trying to get it from all angles is, yeah. is great. Yeah, if you, if you take one, one particular operation and you look at which different units uh, were all involved in the operation, yeah. so everyone can give his, his version, his version yeah. of exactly what yeah. the experiences yeah. were and what yeah. happened, what they saw. Yeah. That would be good. Okay. Well, is there nothing else? Are you happy that we... we yeah, I think, the I think then, let's, and then we'll let's start this as a, as a first episode yeah, and then, we and then we'll carry on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, guys, um, yeah, legacy viewers out there, um, thanks for watching. I'm sure you'll find this a really good, uh, well, they have found it a really good um, video. Um, from a legacy point of view, I'm excited to see guys are prepared to travel vast distances to to meet and to give their stories because it, it does to me mean that legacy is starting to to catch catch on and 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 become important for veterans um that they part of it and um yes and and uh, leon and tini um thanks for joining me and uh thanks a lot thank you thank you for your opportunity thank yeah. you very much yeah.